This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to easily and efficiently build and manage your own website. Hi everyone, I'm FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore nuzlocke of the ROM hack Inclement Emerald. Inclement Emerald is a catch-em-all advanced difficulty ROM hack created by Bufflesaft that features a wide range of changes to the baseline Pokemon Emerald game, including the addition of all Pokemon from the first seven generations, updated game mechanics, changes to Pokemon stats, typings, and movesets, and so much more. This game is an absolute blast, and I highly, highly recommend it to anyone who wants to do a casual playthrough, a hardcore nuzlocke, or anything in between. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Now, I know what you're thinking. What does inclement even mean? And here's the thing. No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. The specific rule set for my playthrough is in the description below, but as with most ROM hacks, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So let's get started with my very first playthrough of Pokemon Inclement Emerald. As I gain sentience and exit the back of a moving truck that my mom has shoved me into, the Hoenn of Inclement Emerald appears to be identical to the Hoenn of the Vanilla Emerald that I've come to know and love over the last 18 years. But it isn't long before it becomes clear that things are quite a bit different. For example, in Inclement Emerald, you get to choose between any of the starter Pokémon from the first seven generations of Pokémon. And the choice is perfectly clear. I choose the cutest, roundest, owliest of the starters, Rowlet. And Matt Damon becomes the first of many, many team members. Also, at the time, I thought I didn't have Gen 7 sprites downloaded, so I decided to create my own image of Rowlet in the layout by drawing him from memory. This pretty quickly devolves into me drawing every single one of my teammates, so if you have a thing for art that looks like it was created by a deeply disturbed but also profoundly untalented six-year-old, you're gonna love this video. Anyways, after defeating Maze Torchic and getting access to Pokeballs, it's time to get some encounters. I start by heading to Route 102 where I find a Gothita. This clairvoyant toddler almost ends up tearing apart Sweet Matthew's mind with his psychic powers, but we imprison him just in time, and Day Lewis becomes my second team member. Then it's off to Route 103, where I find a Gurbin, which is a truly phenomenal 10% encounter. Vikavolt got incredibly buffed in Inclement Emerald and now has the base stat total of a pseudo-legendary. So as long as I don't accidentally kill Sweet Vin Diesel here, he'll be a vital member of the family going forward. As we make our way towards Petalburg City, now's a good time to mention Inclement Emerald's built-in level scaling system. Based on settings chosen at the beginning of the game, Inclement Emerald uses dynamic level scaling, meaning that as the levels of my party Pokémon increase, so too do the levels of Wild and Trainer Pokémon. Additionally, this game has built-in level caps for each gym badge, so once your Pokémon hits the level cap of the next gym, they effectively stop gaining experience points. This built-in level cap system has its strengths and weaknesses, but one of the positives is that you can pretty much immediately bring your Pokémon up to the level cap without fear of overleveling. And since this mode of Inclement Emerald doesn't have effort values, I don't even have to worry about missing out on those. Immediately leveling up my Pokémon does mean that enemy Pokémon will also immediately be at a higher level, so it doesn't really make the game any easier, it just makes it faster and more convenient. Roxanne's level cap of 16 allows Matt Damon to evolve into Dartrix as we leave Petalburg City and head into Petalburg Woods. There I catch a Paris who I name P. Hilton. Spore is always a useful asset to have, so this encounter definitely could have been worse. North of Rustboro City on Route 115, I fish up a Whalmer. Whalelord can have the ability Drizzle, and after a certain point in the game, ability capsules become a purchasable item, so Jack Black here is a pretty great encounter. You'll notice that there are a lot of great encounters in this game, which is one of the reasons why I think it's such a fun ROM hack. On Route 116, I find a female Ninkata, marking the spiritual return of Queen Basalt, Queen of my heart, body and soul. This time we name her Olsen, and she'll technically evolve into two Pokémon, but I'll only be using Ninjask since I don't really want to use Shedinjo with Wonder Guard. In Verdant Earth Tunnel, I catch a mischievous little Teddy Ursa named Ted Danson, who will be pretty great once he evolves into an Ursaring with Guts. Then it's off to a new area in Inclement Emerald called Sea Spray Cave. There are a handful of these new areas throughout the game, which allow for more potential encounters. Unfortunately, my encounter in this one is a Psyduck, which isn't all that great, but another water type before the first gym badge isn't the worst thing in the world either. After that, I backtrack to Route 104 and catch a Pit of, which even in this ROM hack is not a particularly exciting encounter. 
I'm pretty sure I never used D. Cameron for this entire playthrough. Now before members of the Pit of Patrol come in to say that actually Unfezen is good because this one time at Bandcamp I got a critical hit with Super Luck, there's just too many other far stronger Pokemon in this game. From here on out, I won't be mentioning every single encounter we come across. For now, the final roster edition is in Rustboro City, where I speak with a man who wants to trade me his Ponyard for the child I kidnapped from Route 102, which I happily accept. And with that, it's time to face off against Roxanne for the very first gym badge of Inclement Emerald. Obviously, her team has gotten a significant buff in this ROM hack, and still being so early in this game, I don't quite have my sea legs under me, so to speak. I really don't have a plan here. I'm just running on vibes. Roxanne leads with her AA Ron, and I lead with Jack Black. A water gun hits her pretty hard before she retaliates with a fairly soft rock tomb. This does lower our speed, but Jack is still fast enough to take her out with a second water gun, which brings in Lyleep. I don't know how the AI works quite yet, so I'm not sure if she's going for Mega Drain or if she wants to use Rock Tomb to lower our speed. But since critical hits deal 1.5 times damage like in later generations, instead of 2 times damage like in vanilla Gen 3 games, Jack Black never dies to a crit here. So, I stay in to do some damage with Water Gun. <laughs> I'm in danger! Well that was dumb, but it is recoverable. I switch to Day Lewis, who gets hit by a now plus one Mega Drain. Then we hit Lyleep with a hard cut that has been changed to a steel type move in this game. It doesn't quite kill, so Lyleep hits us with a Rock Tomb that lowers our speed and also activates our Defiant ability. We're still faster, so a second cut finishes off Lyleep as Roxanne's Ace Nose Pass comes in third, but the Defiant boost is gonna have to go to waste. Nose Pass knows Fire Punch, somehow, so it's off to Goldie Han. We do good damage with Bubble Beam on the next few turns, but a Berry Juice and the speed drops from Rock Tomb mean that Roxanne's Sentient Rock is able to get off three Rock Tombs, including one crit, before she goes down. After that is Tyrant. I switch to Day Lewis on a soft critical hit bite. Then a cut leaves Chomper with a sliver before activating his held red card, which randomly switches Day Lewis out into one of my Pokemon. It's a small miracle that it's Olsen that comes out instead of one of my Pokemon who has already taken some damage, because they'd absolutely be dead. Tyrant goes for a Dragon Tail on the next turn, so we're able to outspeed and kill him with another cut. Fifth is Amara, so it's back to Day Lewis who resists an echoed voice. And then a four times super effective cut takes out Littlefoot in one shot. That just leaves Anorith, who manages to outspeed us here. So it's off to Matt Damon, who loses his Orenberry to a Bug Bite. Then we nail Anorith with a Bullet Seed, which connects three times and leaves him in the red. But Matt is safe to even a critical hit Rock Tomb. Though with the speed drop, we no longer outspeed, so it's off to Ted Danson. He takes decent damage from Rock Tomb, but it isn't quite enough. Anorith just goes for a cut on the next turn for a squeak of damage, and then Ted finishes him off with a cut of his own, winning us the first gym badge. Certainly not the cleanest battle, but it's the early game and we're still figuring things out. High fives all around. Well, except Day Lewis. A head nod of approval will have to do. And with that victory, it's a great time to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. Unlike ROM hacks, Squarespace is designed to make everything as easy as possible. With their all-in-one platform, it's super simple to quickly design polished websites directly from customizable templates. For example, I use Squarespace to launch my very own website, poppyhg.com, the home of dozens of curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. Squarespace also has a ton of other really useful features, like analytic information about the traffic of your website, the ability to add and play embedded videos directly on your website, and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members-only content. So, if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby, then you should absolutely check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. Brawly's level cap is 25, which means a bunch of my Pokemon can evolve, like Vin Diesel. It'll still be a while until we get Vicavolt, but we're getting closer. After arriving in Duford Town, I can also get a bunch of new encounters, some of which will be quite useful. In a new area called Duford Meadow, I find a Flabibi named J. Binoche, or J. Binoche, depending on how I'm feeling. She'll be an incredible special defensive tank once she evolves into Florgis. Within Duford Meadow is Duford Manor, where I catch a Mime Junior who I named Chaplin. There are a bunch of potential ghosts in this place that would have been a lot cooler than this tiny pink weirdo. 
but I feel like being forced to catch Mime Jr. when I wanted a cooler Pokemon instead will forever be my curse. Still, Mr. Mime is a solid Pokemon, so I can't really complain. North of Duford Town, on Route 106, there are now Grass Patches, so from here I catch an Execute who I named Dan DeVito. This is another very lucky encounter, especially right before Brawly. Then, it's off to deliver Mr. Stone's letter to Steven deep inside Granite Cave. It's nice to see that even in Inclement Emerald, Mr. Stone is still taking care of his two sons. While we're here, I pick up an A. Aaron, who I name Aaron Paul. Yet another excellent encounter, though obviously not for Brawly. And now that the letter to Steven has been delivered, I can head to Slateport City. There's a handful of encounters here as well, but most importantly, there are also a few very useful NPCs. One of them will change the nature of my Pokémon for the price of a few Orin Berries. This game has a lot of ways to customize and optimize your Pokémon for specific battles, which, as with most things, does have its strengths and weaknesses based on how you prefer to play the game. But for me, it's one of my favorite parts of playing ROM hacks. The near-limitless possibilities makes team building and strategizing so fun and so rewarding. In addition to the Nature Changer, the vendor at the Slateport Pokemart has a handful of Evolution Stones, which I can use to evolve Dan DeVito into a very powerful Executor. There's also two encounters here of note. First is a Horsey from Fishing in Slateport City. I name her Tessa T. Then, from Route 109, I catch a Sandy Ghast who I name Adam Sand. Upon evolution, Adam will have the ability Sandstream, which will give me very useful permanent Sandstorm weather. With that, it's time to face off against Brawly. He is notably scarier than Roxanne, but the first two gyms in this game are far more forgiving than the next six. He leads with Meditite, and I lead with JB Noche. A single Draining Kiss, which got buffed to 75 base power, is enough to one-shot Brawly's lead. This brings in Breloom second, who has Spore. So, it's off to Dan DeVito, who's immune. Breloom's held Toxic Orb activates here, indicating he has Poison Heal. But that doesn't really matter, since after tanking a soft Bullet Seed, Dan is able to one-shot the Mushroom Warrior with an unnecessary critical hit Psy Shock. Third is Daywat with X-Scissor, so I gotta switch back to JP Nosh, who tanks that just fine. With the held Eviolite, the little otter easily survives a draining kiss and nails my fairy with a pretty hard razor shell, though fortunately it doesn't get the defense drop or the critical hit. I otter consider myself quite lucky. A second draining kiss takes out Daywat and gets back a bit of HP, but ideally I'd like to have a little bit more as Lucario comes in fourth. But oh well, we can make do. I switch to P. Hilton on a Bullet Punch, who has evolved into Parasect since we last saw her. She's also gotten a decent boost in her stats in this ROM hack, making her a fairly effective answer into Brawly's furry fighter. Lucario goes for Bulk Up, which is a little worrisome, especially because he's holding a Lumberry that cures the sleep from Spore. But after a second Bulk Up, he falls asleep from our second Spore. And then it's just a matter of trying to take out Lucario with Brick Break before he wakes up and kills P. Dog. In hindsight, it probably would have been better to just go for Brick Breaks right away, but it ends up working out okay despite Lucario getting off a nasty reversal at around 5% HP. The change from crits doing double damage to them doing only 1.5 times damage in Generation 6 and beyond is low-key one of the biggest changes to Nuzlocking difficulty, at least when it comes to pulling off RNG-proof strategies. Anyways, 5th is Hitmonchan, so it's back to JB Noche. This is definitely Brawly's scariest Pokémon, because his coverage is insane, especially into the team I brought. I hate doing this, but I really just have to hope that we dodge a crit and a freeze here with JB Noche. Thankfully we do, so a Draining Kiss hits Hitmonchan hard. On the following turn, I switch to Chaplin, who moderately tanks an Ice Punch. Then we can outspeed and finish off Hitmonchan with a Confusion. If a single one of those Ice Punches had frozen my Pokémon, though, we'd have been in a lot of trouble. So this has been a fairly lucky fight. Last for Brawly is Hariyama, so it's off to Matt Damon on a bulk up. On the next turn, we go for a pluck to eat his eld citrus berry as he gets greedy and goes for a second bulk up. With the two defense boosts, I switch to air cutter, which crits and brings Hariyama into the red. A knockoff hits us in return for a ton of damage, but because I intentionally didn't give him an item, Jason Bourne would have just barely survived even a crit. So with one last pluck, Ariyama falls, we've won the second gym badge, and attempt one of Inclement Emerald remains deathless. We've got a fairly long road to get to Mauville City where Watson awaits with the third gym badge, hence the level cap skyrocketing to level 38. Along the way are a few fairly difficult mini-boss fights, including a brand new one against Archie in the Slateport Museum. I wouldn't say I was exactly prepared for this fight when it happened, so it gets a little shaky at times, and I have to dodge a few crits, but it all ends up working out. 
This fight does become a bit of a wake-up call for me that I need to start seriously preparing for even the smallest of mini-boss fights. This is a ROM hack, after all. Once I get to Mauville City, I can get just a crap load of new encounters from the various routes and towns surrounding it. Additionally, there's an NPC in the daycare center on Route 117 that will give you a bunch of eggs that can be hatched in areas that don't otherwise have encounters, like in Trainer Hill or Little Root Town, for example. So in due time, my box becomes stacked with mostly great Pokémon. I'll mention a handful of important ones here. First is Emma Watts the Chinchow, fished up from Route 110. Next is a Feebas hatched from an egg in Oldale Town, who I named Chalamet. Then I hatch a core fish from an egg in Verdanturf Town and name her Joan Craw. Finally, I get an Audino named Paul Dano that is gifted to me by a random NPC in a new area south of Verdant Turf Town called Verdant Glade. Audino is a deceptively useful support Pokémon with access to the ability Regenerator and moves like Encore Wish, Yawn, and Helping Hand. It's always great to have a solid support Pokémon. And speaking of support, if you want to be like Paul Dano the Audino, and I mean who wouldn't, you can help support the channel by checking out my newly launched Patreon. It's the best way to directly support the channel, and membership comes with various small perks and bonus content, which you can see by checking out the link in the description. Rest assured though, I'll never put challenge runs or main channel videos behind a paywall. This is just an extra way for those of you who want to support the channel to be able to do so. Honestly, just watching my videos is more than enough support. And maybe subscribing to the channel, that one's free. Anyways, now it's time to take out Wally in front of the Mauville City Gym. He's been buffed from having a lone Ralts in Vanilla Emerald to having a team of four Pokémon in Inclement Emerald. So in the grand scheme of things, he's still pretty easy. His lead Roselia is easily one-shot by an Aerial Ace from Queen Olsen. That brings in Fletchinder, who is easily walled by Emma Watts the Lantern. So all I need to do is switch her in. And while I'm at it, I might as well baton pass her Olsen speed boost. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna baton pat. Oh my god, what?! Oh fuck, it's got that speed thing! Oh, I forgot about that! And so, the first death of the run comes at the hands of Wally. Honestly, though, I deserve it. Because here's what happened like two minutes before that. Uh, Uncle Please, I want to challenge the gym and I see how much better I've become. Please, may I please? Talk sh Get hit. Rest in peace, Olsen. Well, other than forgetting that Gale Wings gives Fletchinder priority flying type attacks, there's no additional mistakes made in this fight, so Olsen is the only casualty from our first brush with Wally. That means that we've made it to Watson. Before that, I do get one last encounter, which will be a huge help in this fight, a Munchlax named Farley from the Mauville City Game Corner down by the river. He pretty quickly evolves into a powerful Snorlax, so our team is looking solid as Watson brings in his lead Galvantula. He sets up a Sticky Webs, which will slow all of my Pokémon down as they switch in, but then Farley hits him with a Yawn. A Bug Buzz on the following turn hits Farley really hard before he's able to retaliate with a Body Slam that puts the Scary Spider into the yellow before he takes a nap. So, after some leftovers recovery, a second Body Slam finishes off Galvantula. That brings in Watson's Rotom Mo. So I switch to Hilton, who unfortunately gets hit by a Toxic on the switch. Rotom then nails her with a Hex, which does a hefty chunk of damage thanks to the Toxic. But a Leech Life and Leftovers restores enough HP to get us back to nearly full health. Still, I decide to switch to Paldano, who should be immune to Hex, but Rotom opts for Volt Switch to bring in Manetric, who you'll notice is two levels higher than the level cap of 38. For the remainder of the game, boss battles will usually have one or more Pokémon at a level that's higher than the built-in level cap which certainly makes things harder. Manetric hits Paul Dano with a signal beam, which doesn't make much sense, but it does let us get off a fairly safe yawn. Then I switch to Farley on a super weak flamethrower as Watson's pup snoozes. We hit him with a few body slams, though a held citrus berry means that he's able to survive too. Fortunately, we luck out and get three full turns of sleep on Manetric, so he goes down and Farley has recovered to almost full HP with passive leftovers recovery. So Rotom comes back out. I switched to Matt Damon, who has evolved into Decidueye, but I forgot about Sticky Webs, which ensures that we won't be outspeeding the Zippy Lawnmower before getting nailed with a Hex on the next turn. So this was a misplay, meaning that it's off to Paul Dano, who is immune to Hex. Then Rotom uses Volt Switch, bringing Magneton in, who easily shrugs off a Hyper Voice. 
I decide to gamble a little and stay in, which pays off as we encore Magneton into using Electric Terrain. This lets me safely switch to Farley, though Watson actually switches as well, bringing Rotom back in. I guess the AI is a little smarter in this game than in most, and can't be cheesed with Encore. That's good to know. So I switch to Matt Damon on another Toxic. Then it's a safe switch into Paul Dano on a Hex. The switches are a bit tedious, but it's the safest way to deal with this team. A switch to Emma Watts here lets her eat up a Volt switch with her Volt Absorb ability. Then it's off to Dan DeVito on the baited Leaf Storm, though that still does a stupid amount of damage despite resisting the hit. Another Volt Switch brings Magneton back in, who shrugs off a Psyshock. So it's off to Emma Watts on another Electric Terrain. Magneton actually switches out to Rotom, so at long last we take them out with a Water Pulse. This brings in Magneton yet again, but for some reason Watson immediately switches out to Alolan Raichu, who gets hit by a Water Pulse. The Surfboarding Squirrel has Grass Knot, so it's off to Farley, who despite being quite heavy, shrugs it off thanks to his high special defense stat. After tanking a second Grass Knot, a Body Slam finishes off Raichu. So Magneton comes out again. They set up Electric Terrain one last time, and then Bulldoze from Farley leaves them with a sliver. Freaking Eviolite. Okay, well Magneton just goes for Thunder Wave, and then we finish them off. So last is Watson's Lantern. He has an Air Balloon, meaning that we gotta first hit him with a Body Slam, but thanks to Stab, that actually does more damage than Bulldoze anyways. And since Farley refuses to get fully paralyzed even a single time, he successfully takes out Lantern a few turns later, winning us the third Gym Badge. So now, the entire northwestern region of Hoenn is ours to explore, and with it comes a deluge of new encounters and a fancy new level cap of 50. On Route 112, I catch a sock named Jet Li, who will be important in a few key battles down the line. In Fiery Path, I catch a Slugma named Steve Buscemi, who, believe it or not, is a phenomenal Pokémon in this game. More on that later, though. The Pokémart in Falarbor Town has a few more evolution items, including Shiny Stones, which I can use to evolve JB Noche into a very powerful Florges. On Route 113, I catch a Bufalon, who I will never use, but he has such a banger nickname, I just had to give him a moment in the spotlight. Welcome to the team, Mark Buffalo. Enjoy your time in the recesses of the box. On Route 114, I catch a Fampy named Hopkins. Is this the Bible? In Meteor Falls, I catch a Solrock named Charlie Day. And lastly, back in Falarber Town, I hatch a Ponyta from an egg and name him Will Arnett. This gets us to what is known as one of Inclement Emerald's first major run-enders, the multi-battle against Team Magma in Meteor Falls. The reason this is so scary is twofold. First, you're paired with your rival, who, since she's controlled by AI, can be either super helpful or completely useless. It's kind of a toss-up. Second, because this is a true multi-battle instead of a double battle, you only get three Pokémon to work with. So as you can imagine, prepping for six Pokémon with just three is a pretty tall order, especially with your rival doing lord knows what. Battles like these tend to need a bit of luck, a bit of cheese, or a healthy combination of the two to make it out in one piece. As the battle begins, Courtney and her trusted Grunt lead with Ninetales and Exedrill, the former of which sets up the sun with Drought. To take advantage of that, we've led with Will Arnett, who's now a Rapidash, and Blaziken. Thanks to Will's ability Reckless, we're able to nail Exedrill with an absolutely nasty Flare Blitz that kills despite him holding an Aka Berry. That's huge because Blaziken can now hopefully put in some work here. He starts by hitting Ninetales with a Sky Uppercut after she graciously misses a Hypnosis. Shiftry comes in next for the Grunt, so you best believe we're going to be targeting down that side to make this a 2v1. Shiftry does have Chlorophyll though, so he outspeeds and nails Blaziken with a hard Air Slash, which activates his held Citrus Berry. But then, a second Flare Blitz from Will cleanly takes out the Grass-type, as Hypnosis from Ninetales connects onto Blaziken. If you notice here, Will's Citrus Berry actually activates after Ninetales moves, instead of right after we take Flare Blitz Recoil. This seems to be a tiny error in the way the game is coded. Not a big deal here, but you could imagine that this would be really bad if we were banking on the Citrus Berry activating to survive a hit from Courtney's Fox. Anyways, we're one Pokémon away from making this a 2v1, as the Nameless Grunt brings in Weezing. I switch in Farley as Ninetales misses another Hypnosis, and Weezing lands a fairly soft Sludge Bomb. So far, we're getting pretty lucky. A second Hypnosis connects on the next turn, but our held Chesto Berry wakes us up. Weezing then hits a second Sludge Bomb, and that one gets the Poison, which is a little bit annoying, but at the very least we can hit him for a bit of damage with a Body Slam. I want to heal Farley with Rest here, but I forgot to teach it to him before the fight, which isn't great. 
All of his other attacks were important for Courtney's team as well, but without recovery, he's effectively useless from here on out. I decide to switch to Paul Dano as Nene Tails uses Calm Mind. Blaziken wakes up and nails Weezing with a Blaze Kick, but it's not enough to take him out. Permanent Sun and Rain were nerfed in this game to only increase fire and water type moves respectively by 20% instead of the usual 50%, and boy are we seeing the effects of that here. Nene Tails puts Blaziken back to sleep with Hypnosis, and Weezing hits him with a Sludge Bomb, letting Paul get off a free wish. So it's off to Will, who gets hit by yet another Hypnosis from Nene Tails, before Blaziken gets a lucky one-turn wake-up and takes out Weezing with a Blaze Kick. That's a huge relief as Will is back to full HP, and this nightmare of a battle is now a 2v1. Will takes his guaranteed first turn of sleep here as Nene Tails kills Blaziken with a Solar Beam. All in all, Blaziken had a great performance. Rest well. So next for Mei is Starmie, which is a pretty great Pokemon to have here. A Life Orb boosted Power Gem does good damage to Nene Tails, though not enough for the kill thanks to the earlier Calm Mind. Will takes another turn of sleep, so the pesky vixen hits him with a fairly soft mystical fire. I'd rather have that than a solar beam into Starmie. So on the next turn, I switch to Paul Dano, as Starmie finally kills Courtney's first Pokemon with a Psychic. That brings in Houndoom next, which is where having Blaziken still alive would have been pretty nice. But Paul Dano can use Helping Hand to give Starmie the boost needed to kill the Hellhound in one shot with a single power gem. That just leaves Courtney with Crocodile. She's holding an Assault Vest to boost her special defense, so even with the Helping Hand, an Aurora Beam doesn't get the one-shot. But it does enough. Crocodile just kills Starmie with a Crunch, bringing out May's final Pokémon, her Mimikyu. Crook has no way to kill either of our Pokémon in one shot, so this is all wrapped up. Plus, Mimikyu just outspeeds and manages to put all Zacians to shame by connecting with a Play Rough, killing the Lawless Gator, and winning us the hardest battle of the game so far. But we're not done with Team Magma yet. Not by a long shot, as now we need to stop Maxi from blowing up a volcano or whatever he's doing on top of Mount Chimney. Before him though, we need to face off against Tabitha, who only has four Pokemon, but is still a pretty big issue. He starts with a Gigalith that sets up Sandstorm as I lead with Dan DeVito. Dan has a new ability created specifically for Inclement Emerald called Chloroplast, which means that he acts like it's always sunny. Wait, that actually wasn't even intentional, but it's a pretty great coincidence. Anyways, this means that he's able to fire off a one-turn solar beam that obliterates Tabitha's scary Gigalith. But that thing looks like an Iggly buff compared to his next Pokémon, Darmanitan, who with Life Orb and Sheer Force has horrifying damage output potential, especially if he crits. My plan is to first switch to Bushemi on a Flare Blitz, who still takes a sizable chunk of damage despite Flare Blitz being quad-resisted. Then I switch to Joan Craw, who at the very least can't be crit, though a Rock Slide still does good damage. And now we're in a tight spot. High rolls of Flare Blitz will kill Joan after Sandstorm Chip, but I gotta risk her here. Nothing else on my team survives a crit from this monster. So, Flare Blitz hits, but it does just a little too much damage. We do thankfully connect with a Razor Shell, which kills Darmanitan, but then, the Sandstorm claims the second death of the run. Not to piss on the grave of a dear friend, but I'm glad it was Joan over pretty much anyone else. Like, ultimately this is not that big of a deal. Tabitha only has two more Pokémon left, the first of which is Steelix. I bring in Adam Sand, who's able to eviscerate him with two Earth Powers while only having to tank one Iron Tail. Last is Glysaur, who has Poison Heal and Toxic Orb. So I switch to Paul Dano, who, after Glysaur surfaces from a dig, hits him with Simple Beam, which changes his ability from Poison Heal to Simple, thereby making him take damage from his own Toxic Orb. A few turns later, we basically kill him with a single Icy Wind, so I'm sure Chalamet in the back would have been able to get the one-shot, but I just think that getting rid of Poison Heal with Poly D is hilarious. And in Nuzlocking, it's always better to go with the funniest option. That wins us the fight against Tabitha. Maxi is next, but actually significantly easier than Tabitha. Part of this is because I hatch a few more eggs that turn out to be some very useful encounters. On Mount Chimney, I hatch a Snover, who I name Harrington. He's not useful for Maxi, but I also go back to Petalburg City and hatch a Pharaoh Seed, who I name Spike Lee. Originally, I had skipped getting an encounter in Petalburg City so that I could surf there later, but I decided to gamble that an Eggmon would be better than whatever other encounter I could get. 
And I was right. Spike Lee is an unbelievably incredible Pokemon and walls a lot of pretty scary Pokemon single-handedly. For example, Maxie's Victory Bell, who is otherwise kinda scary, literally can't touch Spike Lee other than with Sucker Punch. In fact, Maxie's entire team is made up of Pokemon that are each walled fairly easily by one of my Pokemon. So let's just skip this battle and move on. For now, the world is saved and we can head to Lava Ridge Town where the next gym leader awaits. Prior to this fight though, you guessed it, there's more encounters. In a new location, Ember Path, I catch a Magmar and I name him Ben Affleck. Then on Ravage Path, I use Honey to all but guarantee a Hakamo'o, who I name Uma Thurman. And then, the last relevant encounter is an Eggmon hatched in Lava Ridge Town, which ends up being a Meryl, who I name Streep. So, after drawing a spot-on portrait of my new Kamo'o, it's off to fight Flannery for the fourth gym badge. She leads with Torkoal, who instantly sets up the sun with Drought. But by using a minus speed nature, we can intentionally underspeed her Torkoal, which lets us instantly override the sun with our Sandstream ability. After that, I immediately pivot to JB Nosh on a Stealth Rock. And then this next part is a bit annoying. JB Nosh knows Leech Seed, Wish, Defog, and Draining Kiss. Leech Seed does passive damage, Wish gives us reliable recovery, and Defog can be used to clear away Torkoal's Stealth Rocks, which is pretty imperative for the various switches we'll be doing later. The annoying thing is that Torkoal knows Rapid Spin, which can spin away our Leech Seed, so it takes far longer than I originally expected to get everything set up. But by skipping a few turns here, we can get to the point where Torkoal goes down, Stealth Rocks are gone, and JB Nosh is at relatively full HP. That brings in Arcanine second for Flannery. So I switch to Buscemi, who shrugs off a of Flare Blitz. Fun fact! Because Makargo has the ability Simple in this game, Buscemi could pretty easily solo sweep Flannery's entire team with Shell Smash and a White Herb. But given the absurd amount of great Pokemon that this game gives you, I wanted to try and beat it without using setup sweeps. So, instead of sweeping Flannery's entire team, Buscemi's Bloodlust will have to be content with just a few kills. Here though, he's just used to bait Flannery's fluffy dog into using close combat, which gives the pup a few safe defense drops with some careful switches. After two, we can painlessly kill him with a priority Aqua Jet from Streep, who has evolved into a Zoomerill. Easy peasy. Third is Volcarona, so it's back to Buscemi. This is a little scary because Volcarona goes for Quiver Dance and is holding a Charty Berry. But especially with the special defense boost from Sandstorm, our Italian American slug is bulky enough to take care of Volcarona with a combination of Power Gem and Rock Slide. Thank you for not missing that Rock Slide, Steve. Next up is Houndoom, who is easily checked by Uma Thurman. Dark Pulse does nothing on the switch, and neither does the Fire Gem boosted Overheat that we have to tank on the following turn. Okay, I mean it doesn't do nothing, but Sky Uppercut easily takes her out in return. So fifth is Talonflame, who has Gale Wings. I'm not stupid enough to make that mistake twice. On the next turn, I switch to Buscemi, who easily tanks the Brave Bird. Then Talonflame U-turns out to Flannery's final team member, her Blaziken, as Buscemi gets off a free recover. So now it's a switch to Charlie Day. They fortunately avoid a paralysis from Thunder Punch, and then they tank an overheat before retaliating with a Zen Headbutt that gets the one-shot. So all that's left is the Talonflame, which Charlie Day could probably handle perfectly fine on their own, but let's give it to Buscemi. He comes in, shrugs off a few weak moves, and then snipes the bird out of the sky with a power gem, winning us the fourth gym badge. Halfway there. With access to the desert on Route 111 and a few new inclement emerald locations, I can get a handful of new encounters, most of which are pretty cool. From Mirage Tower, my encounter is none other than a Trap Hinch. So I name her after probably my favorite actress, Anya Taylor-Joy. It's pretty late in the video to be doing a question of the day, but for those of you who have made it this far, let me know who your favorite actor or actress is in the comments down below. In Sandstrewn Ruins, in addition to collecting a handful of fossils, I catch a Yamask, which is pretty great because in this game, Kofagrigus is part steel type. I name our new ghostly team member Demi Moore. And then I head back to Rustboro City where I revive one of the fossils I picked up. I choose to revive the old Amber, so it's Sam Neil, the Aerodactyl, who joins the rotation. This means it's time for a healthy bout of patricide back in Petalburg City. And here's where the game starts to get real interesting. Because prior to fighting me, my father gives me a Mega Bracelet, which means that I can now Mega Evolve one of my Pokemon once per battle. It also means that basically every boss battle from here on out will also have a Mega on their team. Things just got a lot harder, but also a whole lot funner. 
I decided that for this playthrough, I would allow myself to use a Mega Pokemon in battles where the enemy team also had a Mega Pokemon, which, like I said, is almost every major battle from here on out. For example, Dear Old Dad has a Mega Kangaskhan, which was a notoriously busted Pokemon when she was first introduced. This is a very scary gym battle. But Norman leads with his Swellow, who thanks to leading with Sam Neill, is remarkably unscary. We Mega Evolve Turn 1, which in addition to giving Sam a cartoonishly evil pair of eyebrows and a goatee, gives him enough power and speed to take out Swellow with a single strength, which is now a rock-type close combat with 100 base power. That brings in x Plowed next, who has a range of strong special moves including Surf. So I switch to Uma Thurman, who tanks the Surf easily enough. Then we outspeed and hit her with a Drain Punch. I wasn't expecting that to kill, but it did, so I'll take it. That brings in Tauros next, who somehow manages to intimidate my giant dragon. A Protect reveals that he's just going for close combat, so I just let him hit us with one on the next turn, which doesn't do all that much, lowers his defenses, and means that we can cleanly take him out with a follow-up Aura Sphere. But fourth is the Mega Kangaskhan, so here we go. I start by protecting to scout out Kangaskhan's move as she Mega Evolves. It's Seismic Toss, which is extra scary with her Parental Bond ability because it effectively doubles her damage output to a guaranteed 108. That is, except against Ghost types. With Matt Damon safely in, this should now bait Crunch. So I use U-Turn for some chip and to bring in Demi Moore, which seems a little weird, but a Colber Berry ensures we're safe and her ability Mummy gets rid of Parental Bond, meaning that Mega Kangaskhan has suddenly become much less of an issue. On an Earthquake baited by Demi Moore's secondary steel typing, I switch to Sam Neill for free. Without Parental Bond, we're safe to stay in and hit Kangaskhan with a Wing Attack, which has 80 base power in this game. And then, after tanking just one Seismic Toss, a second hard Wing Attack knocks out the first of many Mega Evolutions that we'll be facing. Next up is Norman's regular ace, his Slay King. A switch to Spike Lee means that he gets hit by a yawn, but this now gives me a safe switch to Uma Thurman as the massive ape takes his obligatory turn of loafing. With Uma Thurman knowing Protect by level up, I thought this was wrapped up, because I can just protect on turns that Slay King isn't loafing. Especially because after one turn of my shenanigans, Norman switches out to his last Pokemon Lanoon, who gets eviscerated by a Drain Punch on the switch. No Elite Four sweep for you, bucko. When Slay King comes back in, I go for another Protect, but it turns out that in this game, Yawn hits through Protect. I'm not sure if that's specific for this fight to avoid cheesing Slay King with Protect, but falling asleep on the next turn certainly catches me off guard. Fortunately, it doesn't really matter. I can switch to Jet Li on the next turn, who's completely safe thanks to his sturdy ability. And then on Slay King's next loafing turn, we're free to beat the ever-loving crap out of him with a close combat, winning the fight against my father, and getting us the 5th Gym Badge. With that, there's another massive jump in the level cap, and now that I have Surf, I can get just a ton of encounters before heading off to Fortree City and beyond. A few of these encounters are really useful, but the first thing I do is head to New Mauville and finally evolve Vin Diesel into a 600 base stat total Vicavolt. Inside New Mauville, I get the static Rotom encounter and name them Rotom Hanks. In the Desert Underpass, I hatch another Eggmon, which ends up being a Wimpod who I name Zellweger. On Route 107, I catch a Frillish and name her Goldberg. And then, on Route 134, I catch a Pelipper named Jason Siegel, which grants me another Pokémon with access to Perma Rain. Those are all the notable encounters from around the western part of Hoenn, so now it's off to Fortree City. Along the way, I catch a Sligu from Route 119 named Paltrow, who evolves into what might be the best Pokémon in the game. In Inclement Emerald, Gudra is Water Dragon type, which is already a phenomenal buff as is, but she also gets the ability Poison Heal, which makes her a phenomenal special wall. Think Blissey, but with the ability to recover almost 20% of her HP every turn, and with the offensive stats of a pseudo-legendary. I have no idea why Buffle Saft made Gudra so powerful, but I don't really care. Paltro is my goopy friend-shaped queen, and as long as we are both breathing, she will almost never leave my side for the rest of the playthrough. Up next are two mini-boss fights. The fight against Shelly and her Mega Beedrill in the Weather Institute, and the rival fight against May on Route 119. We can skip both these fights, though Shelly does give me some whiplash at the start of our battle. Let's tank a blizzard. Um... I think actually the right play was to put an Asperberry here, because if this freezes, that really sucks. <laughs> mm. 
Never punished. But anyways, after those two battles, we're safely in Fortree, which means I can safely explore the town and all the various safe buildings within it, filled with safe and friendly NPCs. This old man is interesting. Oh f Oh no. Ah, damn it. Never talk to strangers, kids. If you don't recognize this guy, Spencer is one of the frontier brains from the Emerald Battle Frontier, who are sprinkled throughout this game as optional battles. Beating them rewards you with some valuable items, but their teams are all quite challenging, so it's a huge mistake to walk into this one without a plan, and somehow also only five Pokémon. I am really freaking lucky that Mega Aerodactyl manages to dunk on a lot of Spencer's team, including being able to outspeed and one-shot his lead Crobat and his Lepra. The rest of his team is also not super hard with the five Pokémon I happen to have on me, so that's a relief because this could have been pretty bad. But you know, Master Ugwe once said that there are no accidents, and maybe that's true here too, because as a reward for somehow miraculously beating Spencer, I get the Choice Scarf, which is an invaluable item that I probably would have never intentionally tried to get. Great job, friends, but let's not do that again. Before Winona, we can actually head all the way down to Lily Cove and pick up new encounters along the way, but half of these encounters I end up basically never using. The ones of note are a Ghastly that hatches from an egg in Fortree City, who I name Nick Cage, a Girder named Margot R that I catch in the Scorched Slab, a Magikarp named Gary Cole from Route 122, a Bagon that hatches from an egg in Lily Cove named Kevin Bagon, and an Arcanine named Owen Wilson from Mount Pyre. Wow. After that, I can fight my rival May for the final time in front of the Lily Cove department store. We'll once again be skipping that for time. But with her out of the way, we can purchase a handful of TMs, chief among them the TM for Protect, which will be super useful for the fight against Winona because it's a double battle. Double battles are always extra scary for me because I find it significantly harder to anticipate and predict what the AI is going to do, making it very hard to plan out the flow of battle. Winona also has a pretty stacked team, including a very intimidating Mega Altaria. But fortunately, we have a Fairy-type Mega of our own, ready to kick some bird ass. Winona leads with Halucha and Gyarados, as I lead with Vin Diesel the Vicavolt and Paul Dano, who now has the power to Mega Evolve. In this game, Mega Audino gets the amazing ability Fairy Aura, which increases the power of Fairy-type moves. With the Choice Scarf strategically snagged from Spencer, Vin Diesel is able to outspeed and one-shot Winona's Halucha, while also getting a safe switch to Aaron Paul. Gyarados hits Eren with a limp Stone Edge as Paul Dano retaliates with a nasty Moonblast that does around 50%. Winona then brings in Aerodactyl next. Both Aerodactyl and Gyarados should be baited into using Earthquake onto Eren. So I switch him into Vin Diesel who has Levitate. They do both fall for the bait, though Paul does still take a decent amount of damage from both hits as he nails Winona's Flying Fish with another Moonblast that leaves him with just a sliver. So on the next turn we start by repeating turn 1. A Volt Switch kills Aerodactyl, and gets a safe switch back into Eren, who shrugs off another Stone Edge. But instead of taking the kill on Gyarados, I go for a Soft Boiled with Paul. Winona replaces her Aerodactyl with Emolja, which is a bit annoying since he has the ability Lightning Rod. Expecting an Electric-type move from the Flying Rat, I switch to Rotom Hanks, who in fan form gets the ability Motor Drive in this game. Unfortunately, Emolja opts for Hurricane into Paul Dano, who gets confused, and then after tanking an Earthquake, he hits himself in confusion. So Paul's pretty much useless for the rest of the battle. The downside of using a Mega is that they can't hold an item like Leftovers for passive recovery, which makes it really difficult to bring them back in after they've switched out. But this isn't terrible quite yet. I switch Paul into Eren who gets hit by a Hurricane, which manages to not confuse, and then Rotom Hanks takes out Gyarados with an Aurora Beam. That brings in Dragonite 5th. Trying to bait an Earthquake, I protect with Eren. This lets me get a completely free Aurora Beam off into Emolja, as Winona hits into Protect with both of her Pokémon. On the next turn, I switch Eren out into Vin Diesel, who gets hit by a Tickle from Emolja. Then, she finally falls to another Aurora Beam, as Dragonite whiffs an Earthquake. But now Altaria comes out, and we're about to be staring down two very powerful Dragon-types. Once Altaria Mega evolves, we use Volt Switch for a bit of chip damage, and to bring in Demi Moore, who will hopefully get rid of Altaria's terrifying pixelate ability that gives him monstrous fairy-type returns. Sadly, he just uses Dragon Dance, which is definitely not ideal. 
Rotom Hanks hits an Aurora Beam into Altaria for decent damage, as Dragonite nails Demi Moore with a Fire Punch, which at least gets rid of his multi-scale ability, though he is still holding a Yachi Berry. So I switch Demi into Gary Cole in order to get off an Intimidate and to avoid being hit by a super effective Earthquake. Unfortunately, Rotom Hanks falls just shy of killing Altaria with a second Aurora Beam. Next is a double switch to Demi Moore and Aaron Paul. It does mean that Altaria gets off a Roost, but we need to reposition here, so there's not much I can do about that. Then I switch Demi Moore into Vin Diesel and protect with Aaron Paul, hoping to bait the double Earthquake. Altaria does go for Earthquake, but Dragonite opts for Fire Punch instead, which nails Vin Diesel hard. It doesn't kill, but it's too much damage to safely stay in. So it's time for another double switch. Vin into Gary for the Intimidate, and Aaron into Rotom Hanks. This works out well, as Gary just has to shrug off another Fire Punch. At this point, I decide that I just need to risk a crit or two, and I stay in with both Pokémon. Dragonite hits a very soft extreme speed into Rotom Hanks, and Altaria goes for Roost. So the Aurora Beam Ice Fang Double Up doesn't get the kill on him. Which means we gotta risk another crit here. Rotom Hanks gets hit by another extreme speed from Dragonite, but unlike last time, Altaria doubles up with a return, and I fear the worst for sweet sweet Rotom Hanks. But no electrical appliances are dying today. Rotom Hanks holds on, and we finally kill Winona's fluffy dragon with an Aurora Beam. All that's left is to finish off the Dragonite on the following turn. I protect with Rotom Hanks to avoid being killed by an extreme speed, and then a Strength takes out the Dragonite, winning us a shaky battle and getting us the 6th Gym Badge. Before we can head to the next gym, there's a whole barrage of battles against various members of Team Aqua and Team Magma, and a lot of these fights are very, very scary. For example, the double battle against Magma admins Tabitha and Courtney, who use Mega Steelix and Mega Houndoom respectively. This battle marks the debut of Anya Taylor-Joy the Flygon, who in this game can Mega Evolve. I may be biased, but I freaking love this game. ATJ also gets a new ability when she Mega Evolves, called Sand Song, that turns all sound-based moves into ground-type moves, which means that she's able to eviscerate large portions of Tabitha and Courtney's teams with now stab super-effective boom bursts, especially when she's next to Chaplin the Mr. Mime, who provides helping hand support and has the ability Soundproof. What could possibly go wrong? High horsepower, perfect. No, 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 no. Oh my god. <laughs> Could you imagine if I lost ATJ in the very first battle that I used her in? If that were the case, this would have been a far more depressing video. But still, that was pretty lucky. Just like last time, the fight against Maxi in the Magma Hideout is way easier than the preceding admin fights, despite him having a freaking Groudon. But that chunky boy goes down to a Grass Knot from Danny D, and the rest of his team is dispatched almost as easily. On the Team Aqua side of things, it's just two battles against Matt and his Mega Gyarados, who is dunked on by first impressions from Zellweger. If you want to check out those battles in more detail, you should really check out the highlight videos of this challenge on my Highlights channel, which is linked in the description down below. Those battles were a lot of fun, but we gotta move on to what's awaiting us in Moss Deep City. Before facing off against Tate and Liza, we can get a ton of new encounters from the various water routes in the eastern part of Hoenn, and we can also hatch a few more eggs on routes where the encounters aren't that great. Some of my favorites from this batch are a Sharpedo from Route 125 named Charlize Theron, a Corsola from Route 128 named Emma Stone, a Rhyhorn hatched on Route 131 named Ryan Goss, and a Sneasel hatched on Route 133 named Adina. So with that, we're ready to face off against Tate and Liza. In addition to being a double battle, this fight is also an inverse battle in this game, meaning that type matchups are inverted. Having some recent experience with inverse battles, I felt well prepared to deal with this particular challenge, and I had a solid plan. Tate and Liza lead with Claydol and Slowbro, and I lead with Ben Affleck and Margot Robbie, the latter who is pre-burned to trigger her Guts ability. Their Slowbro Mega evolves at the start of the battle, but despite his new fearsome form, a super effective flamethrower from Ben gets a clean one-shot. Margot then also cleanly one-shots Claydol with a Drain Punch. That's a great first turn, but Exeggutor and Lunatone come out next, which is not according to plan. 
I expected Soul Rock to come out before Lunatone, since Soul Rock has Flare Blitz, which is a high base power move that's super effective against Ben. But evidently, the AI went for Lunatone with Power Gem into Margo. I'm not sure if going with Lunatone before Soul Rock was guaranteed, or if the AI randomly chose between those two options. Regardless, Lunatone has better special defense than Soul Rock, meaning that they'll survive a flamethrower from Ben, so I can't kill both of these Pokemon like I had planned to. This is bad news because Exeggutor has Chloroplast and Solar Beam, which will get a clean one-shot into Ben. So I decide to protect Ben and take the clean kill on Lunatone with a superpower from Margo. The attack and defense drops aren't great, but it's the only way to ensure the KO and avoid a nasty power gem. Unfortunately, instead of trying to kill Ben, Exeggutor just uses Trick Room, which is very bad as now all of Tate and Liza's Pokemon outspeed all of mine. And given that my plan was to one-shot all of her Pokemon, I'm not really prepared for Trick Room. So suddenly, things are looking really bad as Solrock comes in to replace Lunatone. Basically, I'm gonna need to stall out Trick Room, though that's much easier said than done, especially since a lot of my Pokemon do not have Protect. This is gonna get really ugly, folks. I start by switching Ben into Jet Li, who sadly just gets nailed by a Solar Beam from Exeggutor and a Rock Slide from Soul Rock, making his blue Muppet body go cold before he can do a damn thing. Thank you for your sacrifice, my beautiful boy. I luck out huge and Margo dodges Soul Rock's Rock Slide, so she's free to hit Exeggutor with a low kick that takes him out in one shot. So I bring in Chalamet as Tate and Liza bring in their final Pokemon, Reuniclus. But since Solrock's Flare Blitz is super effective to the rest of my team, this battle is far from over. Inclement Emerald did give Milotic a Mega Evolution, so at least Chalamet becomes a bit bulkier here, but without Protect on either of these Mons, this is a bad situation to be in. Reuniclus sets up a Calm Mind, which for now is fine, and then Solrock goes on the offensive with a Rock Slide. It does decent neutral damage to Mega Chalamet, and then lands a critical hit on Margo, putting yet another one of my fighting types in the grave. This means that both of Tate and Liza's Pokemon survive, as Chalamet just fires off a strong, now stab-boosted Moonblast. So I bring Ben back in on the next turn, and the massacre continues. Reuniclus hits him with a plus one Psychic, which gets a clean one-shot. And then Solrock finishes off Mega Chalamet with a nasty Flare Blitz, bringing Tate and Liza's kill count up to four. And suddenly, that leaves me with just two Pokemon left. Paltrow the Comfort Gudra, and Uma Thurman the Kamo'o. Fortunately though, both of my pseudo dragons know Protect, so we can safely stall out the fifth and final turn of the world's bloodiest Trick Room. And then, a Sludge Bomb from Paltrow kills Solrock, and a Close Combat from Uma one-shots Reuniclus, meaning that we've managed to win the seventh gym badge, and somehow avoid the wipe against Tate and Liza. There's a lot of lessons to learn from this battle, the most prominent being that you should always plan for the worst. Not having Protect on more of my Pokemon was just stupid, and so was not bringing at least one Pokemon that would be able to outspeed Tate and Liza's team under Trick Room. I tunnel visioned way too hard on Solrock coming out before Lunatone, and that was my ultimate downfall. This was a result of poor planning more so than bad luck, so it's really important to reflect on that and acknowledge it. The silver lining is that most of the Pokemon that went down were not major players. It obviously sucks to lose a Mega, and Chalamet is a phenomenal Pokemon in general, but at the very least, Comfort Gudra lives on, and we have enough Pokemon in the box that even though our death count tripled in a single battle, we can carry on. But our trials and tribulations in Moss Deep City aren't over yet, because next up are the fights against Team Magma at the Moss Deep Space Center, which culminates in another multi-battle where I'm only allowed three Pokemon. This time I'm paired with Steven and facing off against Maxi and Courtney. Out of the frying pan and into the fire, this one has a chance of being another run ender. The three Pokemon I choose to go with are Jack Black the Wailord with Drizzle, Uma Thurman the Kamo'o who lived, and Emma Stone the Corsola with Regenerator. Steven's bringing his Cradley, Aerodactyl, and Mega Metagross, so at least we'll have some solid firepower on our side. Maxi and Courtney lead with Victory Bell and Nene Tails respectively. Jack Black's Drizzle overrides the other team's sun, making things a little bit easier right off the bat. Courtney's pesky fire type kicks things off with a fairly strong Moonblast into Jack, which gets the 30% special attack drop, and then Victory Bell hits a Sleep Powder, though that is at least cured by a held Chesto Berry. So Jack can now use Surf to hit everyone on the field, which does okay damage to our opponents, despite the special attack drop, 
but more importantly, activating Cradley's Storm Drain, giving them a boost to their special attack, and letting them kill Courtney's first Pokemon with a Power Gem. Look at Jack and me learning from our mistake against Roxanne. How poetic is that? Second for Courtney is her Crocodile, who's sporting an Assault Vest. She hits Cradley with a hard Iron Tail that he fortunately survives, as Victory Bell lands another Sleep Powder, sending Jack off to Dreamland. But Cradley is awake and able to hit Crook with a Giga Drain that does really great damage and brings him back to almost full HP. On the next turn, Crookedile connects with another Iron Tail, which Cradley once again survives, but sadly, Victory Bell finishes the job with a Poison Jab. Jack does get a lucky early wake up to land a Surf, but because of the Moonblast special attack drop from earlier, it's not enough to kill Crookedile. That's really unfortunate, but had I gone for a single target Weather Ball instead of Surf, we would have gotten the KO so that was a misplay on my part. Steven brings in Metagross next, who immediately Mega Evolves as expected. I switched Jack to Uma Thurman before Mega Metagross uses a Bullet Punch to finish off Crocodile, but then Victory Bell lands a third Sleep Powder into Uma. Not great. Houndoom comes in last for Courtney. She immediately Mega Evolves as well, and then nails Metagross with a Dark Pulse that almost just straight up gets the one shot. Fortunately, Metagross survives. Or maybe unfortunately, because instead of targeting down Houndoom, they go for the kill on Victory Bell, which brings out a far more dangerous Crobat in his place. This is looking really bad. Not wanting to get Brave Birded by Crobat, I switch to Emma Stone, but that ends up being pretty dumb, because Crobat just Brave Birds Metagross for the KO, which then redirects Mega Houndoom's Dark Pulse into Emma. Which crits. So, with Steven down to his last Pokemon, this is now looking very, very bad. It looks like a wipe. I switch Emma to Uma Thurman as Crobat lands a Hypnosis onto Aerodactyl. I mean, I gotta respect the play, but it is really frustrating to be playing around these low accuracy sleep moves. Naturally, Aerodactyl snoozes as Uma tanks a Dark Pulse. On the next turn, I bring Emma back in, who tanks a Brave Bird. Aero snoozes again, so he gets hit by a hard Dark Pulse. It doesn't kill, but the next one will, and we don't have a way to take out Houndoom in one shot anyways. So. This is over. On the next turn, Crobat finally misses a Hypnosis, but it doesn't even matter. Aerodactyl stays asleep, and Houndoom hits Emma Stone with a Dark Pulse, introducing the first Galarian Corsola to Hoenn. With a heavy heart, I bring in Jack Black, ready to accept my wipe. Crobat, of course, hits another Hypnosis, and then Aerodactyl finally wakes up, but it's a little too late. Because both of our enemy Pokémon survive a Rock Slide, Aerodactyl takes Life Orb Recoil, and then Houndoom freaking flinches. It is a flinch heard around the world, and it single-handedly saves my run from utter defeat. Because on the next turn, Crobat manages to miss the most important hypnosis of the fight, letting the world's luckiest Aerodactyl kill Crobat and Houndoom with one last rock slide. The feeling of relief here is truly indescribable. The lowest of lows into the highest of highs. I owe you one, Steven, you beautiful bastard. Aerodactyl was an absolute king. But of course, it's not all celebrations, because despite victory, it did come at the price of a kind and innocent life. Emma Stone was only with this team for a short time, and even though she didn't get to do much, she fought brave and valiantly, ultimately becoming a victim to unfortunate circumstances that she had no control over. It's a brutal reminder that life is cruel, and nothing is guaranteed. So be sure to enjoy the time that you're given with the loved ones you have, no matter how short that time may seem. Just like with the battle against Tate and Liza, the planning for this battle wasn't great, and there were a few misplays that could have made this much easier. Clicking Weather Ball instead of Surf was one. The other is that with an Ability Capsule, Uma Thurman could have had the Ability Overcoat, which would have made her immune to Sleep Powder. This would have let Uma pretty safely kill Courtney's Mega Houndoom, and probably saved Emma's life. Simply put, it was a huge oversight on my part. But the great thing about Nuzlocking is that you can always get better, and you can always keep improving. And that's what I'm gonna do, for as long as you guys will allow me to do it. There's still a lot left to explore in Pokémon Inclement Emerald, including one of the craziest and most heartbreaking Elite Four runs I've ever had. But to see all that, you'll have to tune into the next video. Because this marks the end of part one of my Inclement Emerald Nuzlocke. I wanted to end it here so that more time in the video wouldn't spoil the outcome of the Moss Deep battles. Hopefully, you were as convinced of an incoming wipe as I was at the time. Plus, this video is already plenty long, and by cutting it here, we can really dive deep into the next part of this playthrough. 
So, hopefully you tune in to see if I'm able to rise from the ashes of these tragedies and finish Inclement Emerald on Attempt 1, or if there's even more pain to come. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed watching, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know, but I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And lastly, if you want to check out my new Patreon, I'd really appreciate it. The links to everything are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.